it's Bethany, and today I want to talk to you about a topic that is super relevant to me, and I'm guessing is super relevant to many of you as well. It's the topic of singleness. Being single, not having a boyfriend, not having a guy that likes you, just being you with no guy around, and that is me in life. Hey, it's just Kristen here at Girl Define today, and in this vlog, I'm going to be personally sharing with you six things every Christian girl needs to know before getting married. So hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in today. It's Bethany, Kristen, Zach, yeah. and Dave. We are so excited to have our husbands on here to talk about honest conversations about saving sex for marriage. Even up to the first year, I think I was still like, oh, well, it'll happen. And I was even thinking, you know, like, wow, this is such a sweet gift that God has given us this time, just naturally to you know, grow in our marriage and lay this great foundation. And so I was even thinking like, wow, this has been so nice, but then you're two rolled around and now it's two years. And I remember after that first year, kind of going into that second year, that's when my heart started really just wrestling with this question of like, I wonder if there is something wrong. I wonder if there is a problem. And so we started kind of talking, but it still wasn't a big conversation because you know it still hadn't been that much time and then as year one rolled into year two that's when I started really getting concerned like okay this is really abnormal it seems you know like why aren't we getting pregnant and then literally so my yes. wonderful husband Dave surprise I don't know what causes that and we're having a baby yeah. what <laughs> <laughs> so uh a lot of y'all probably are interested in knowing how I found out <laughs> well the story the we'll be right before that oh Hi everyone, and welcome to Squish Gang Ministries. And today we are doing our monthly, The Rhetoric Of. And after the pretty positive audience feedback I got on our last installment on Brittany Dawn, I thought it would be fun to visit the fundies again. So today we're talking about none other than Girl Defined Ministries. But first, links to socials, sources, ways to support the channel, including Amazon, Patreon, YouTube memberships, the whole nine, all down below along with an email to suggest longer form content. I also want to take this time to thank my patrons and my members. So we're going to have three parts of the video today. Part one, who are Kristen and Bethany of Girl Defined. Part two, we're going to do the rhetoric of Kristen Clark specifically. And then part three, we're going to do the rhetoric of Bethany Beal specifically. So what I've done for this one, as opposed to separate components, we're actually just going to do the separate people because Girl of Find is made up of two people. Before we get into all of that, I want to thank the sponsor for this video, Private Internet Access VPN. Whether you're in a coffee shop, an airport, or any other public Wi-Fi, your device is constantly transmitting information out in the open that can, at times, if connected to the same internet, can be intercepted by hackers uh, before it gets to its destination. A VPN, or virtual private network, allows your IP address to be safe guarded does so through a encrypted tunnel kind of base connection so you see on the graphic on the screen essentially what's happening is it's doing a direct pathway without your information kind of just being out in the open and allows for nobody to fiddle with it when connected to a network Hacker, hackers that are connected to the same network as you have the ability to steal your data browsing without private internet access vpn is like having your screenshots that from the group chat going to the person that you're talking about. You know, it's that hidden information that you didn't want out there hitting the wrong person. We all know, we've all done it. We want to talk about somebody. We send the screening to that person. Imagine your private information ending up in the same sort of pickle. So private internet access helps keep your data safe by creating that encrypted tunnel, as I had mentioned before, through their world-class server infrastructure, which has your information shielded in this sort of bulletproof encrypted network. To make things even better, private internet access is really well known for their transparency and are known to never ever store their user data. They have a policy called the no logs policy that's actually been proven multiple times in court. Private internet access is also available on all platforms, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, the whole nine. I actually have it for my iPad Pro. I have it for my iPhone and I have it for my Windows computer. So it gets even better. You can use private internet access to get to shows that do not have access in certain countries. Um, I know that a lot of people like to watch RuPaul's Drag Race on Canadian Netflix, for example. For me personally, I'm planning to travel soon. Uh, in the next year and I'm obsessed with this streaming service in Canada called Crave actually cannot access Crave outside of Canada because it's owned by one of the big three tele companies I checked once I put my VPN to the US it doesn't work but if I'm in the US like my VPN to Canada I can continue watching Crave so that's my kind of what I'm going to be using it for when I travel and then for my personal use frankly I just use it to protect my devices to protect from 
people taking my data. I do a lot of public surfing. I go to school as well and I'll use the internet cafes and stuff that are at the different buildings. So I like to use it for a lot of different things. And one big thing I have been able to look at geolocked things like court hearings and different legal documents that are only accessible in the States. I've been able to actually get past the geolocking with the private internet access VPN. I put my to just like New York or Vermont or something, and then I'm actually able to get to what I need. By using my link in the description, as well as the pinned comment, you can get 83% off private internet access VPN, which comes out to just $2.03 USD per month and four months completely free. Thanks again for private internet access for sponsoring this video. And let's get right into the rhetoric of Girl Defined. So for those of you who are not aware of my The Rhetoric Of series, it is not a comprehensive deep dive on every single thing that's ever done by the individuals or individual or individuals that I'm talking about, rather more of a set of analyzing different aspects of them or different controversies that they've been in to construct kind of the ways that they interact with their audiences. So if you want videos that are relating on like the whole lifespan of the channel or more details on specific controversies, there are going to be videos in the sources that will be a good place to start because typically my sources, I watch a lot of videos that other people make on these people to see what the public perception is and then what I will do and watch videos that they make as well. And then I use those to construct certain points of argumentation that I, know, that I noticed. So with that, we're going to get into part one. Who are Kristen and Bethany of Girl Defined? So Kristen and Bethany are the two owners of the channel called Girl Defined. They're also owned the Girl Defined Industries brand and ministries. So the Girl Defined brand has expanded into books, conferences, courses, merchandise, blogs, a YouTube channel, and much more. This brand is based in Texas and follows foundational evangelical policy and as the main message of the brand. And their mission statement, more or less, is to deliver the message of godly womanhood through the gospel. This is to quote exactly what the website says. I'm going to read the little excerpt that they give you. Since launching Girl Defined Ministries in 2014, our goal has always been the same, to help modern girls understand and live out God's timeless truth for womanhood. In a day and age when girls and women receive so many conflicting messages about their value, purpose, and identity, they desperately need to know that they are, that the only one who can define them is the one who created them. God, allegedly. Girl Defined did not seem to be on too many people's radars outside of the sort of evangelical content space. Prior to Cody Ko and Noel Miller's video, That's Cringe Girl Defined Edition. This video came out March 28, 2018. And while some commentary sphere people were dabbling in it at that time and before, to my research and knowledge and kind of actually having internet at this time, people who were dabbling in it weren't getting the ground that Cody Ko was getting. And this video, as of scripting, had over 33 million views and started a, train, a chain of React videos on Girl Defined. When the sisters started the channel, Kristen was married to her husband, Zach, but Bethany was single for several years into the channel's uh, popularity and inception. The channel's first video, it, or the first one from what I can gather, is still up from January 16th, 2016, which is talking about Bethany being single, and Bethany got married in 2018. Kristen has been married since 2011. All is actually titled How to Find True Joy and Contentment as a Single Girl, which features only Bethany, and it was in the intro sequence of this video. Totally single, and I sure many of you can relate to me. So this video is directed towards all the single girls out there. I don't know about you, but I found myself as a single girl going through seasons or times or even moments of feeling maybe discouraged or fearful or discontent or full of worry or just whatever it is, I found myself kind of going through those hard times in life. The beginning of the channel was very much a secondary element to the already existing blogs, websites, con other such talks and things like that, with the early videos primarily being things like book trailers, ads for exclusive content, and ads for talks and conventions. Not much about their content has changed besides the camera setup and a little bit more higher quality and a slight shift into the modern conservative agenda. Modern, it was always modern, but I'm saying the 2016 conservative agenda versus the 2023 conservative agenda. So for example, in 2016, the focus was pushing forward the shame cycle of slut shaming, Instagram make and makeup, and now had it shifted to 
transgenderism, what it means to be a man, masculinity, and being angry about the pride collection at Target. For this video, we're going to be separating the rhetoric of the sisters because I noticed that there is a distinct message that each one of them are perpetuating separately from each other. And then that gets combined into the videos that they do as a duo. So with that, we're going to move into part two. So part two is the rhetoric of Kristen Clark. Kristen is a sister and girl to find and was married from the beginning of the channel. In this duo, I see Kristen as the representation of feminine subservience in marriage and family. Kristen exists the as the example of the sort of perfect wife who serves her husband second and serves God first. There have been issues that Kristen and Zach have faced with trying to have children. She has experienced fertility issues, which she actually does talk about on the channel. And that was another video in the intro sequence. And this has been documented on the channel previously. This might seem slightly harsh in my, and it's also my opinion, but I've noticed because of this message of femininity, family, subservience to the husband that Girl Define Ministry shares, Kristen had to explain herself. Kristen had to explain herself and her infertility probably more than she would have if she wasn't put in this position. And she had to explain why years after marriage, this sort of nuclear family model that they've been perpetuating for so long just wasn't coming to fruition. Fundamentalist ideology tightly constrains the possibilities that exist for women. In subservience, women are not even supposed to work. Rather, they are to go to church growing up with under their parents. Then they will be courted in their teen years, married in very early adulthood, and then essentially just have as many children as possible and tend to the home. Kristen has adopted two Ukrainian boys who she kind of parades around talks and conventions. Now, I understand that those are adopted kids as opposed to, for example, when I was talking about Brittany Dawn and the foster children. And I do not want to tell anyone how to raise their children, how to run their families. But as we've seen on the platform and even in my own videos time and time again, exploiting children especially when pushing some sort of personal message or a fundamentalist message does not usually go over the greatest. Super long story short, these adopted children from Ukraine do not exist to pr to platform and put forward this agenda that they've been pushing that now that Chrissy can have that sort of nuclear family that has been strived for for so long. Now, I know I've lately been referencing Jesus and John way a ton, okay? I'm getting my money's worth out of these $40 books. Actually, someone said this to me, so if you're in the comments, make yourself known. Thank you so much. Anyways, this novel discusses this sort of evangelical message as a form of forwarding conservative ideology in the political sphere and how it bled into families. And there are several sections of this book that actually describe the nature of this docile housewife as a means of working towards this. Women who chose traditional womanhood didn't always do so because they wanted an easier path. However, many believed it to be the better path. Consider Elizabeth Elliot, the widow of Jim Elliot, one of the five missionaries speared to death in 1956 while trying to make contact with the Hawarani tribe in Ecuador. Elizabeth Elliot had become a popular figure in American evangelicalism after pushing a book on the missionary martyrs and returning to serve for two years among the Hawarani. In 1976, she published Let Me Be a Woman, a book of advice to her daughter upon her engagement. Elliot's maternal voice stands in contrast to Morgan's livelier prose, but their messages were compatible. God created male and female as complementary opposites, Elliot explained. The woman is totally other, totally different, totally God's gift to man. God's gave husbands their rank and a virile drive for domination necessary to fulfill their duty to rule. Self-denial, meanwhile, was at the heart of Christian womanhood. Marriage and motherhood required self-giving, sacrifice, suffering. Yet men were required to love their wives, as this was biblical basis for chivalry. Love and submission were intimately intertwined. The very notion of hierarchy came from the Bible, Ellie contended. In short, equality was not a Christian ideal. A hierarchical order of submission and rule descended from the nature of God himself. God the Father exercised just and legitimate authority. The Son exhibited willing and joyful submission. Within the tr Trinitarian God then existed the elements of rule, submission, and union. Due to a hatred of authority, however, the blueprint has been lost. No man would fulfill his role perfectly, Elliot reminded her daughter. You marry a sinner and you love, accept, and forget the, and forgive that sinner. A woman should also accept the fact that she marries a man. He's likely to be bigger and louder and tougher and hungrier and dirtier than expected. But Elliot assured her daughter the, that real women wanted real men and real men wanted real women. The more womanly you are, the more manly your husband will want to be. Like Morgan, Elliot became a celebrity within the evangelical subculture. Although it's unlikely that the millions of women who read their work did so explicitly as a political act, many evangelical women would develop 
develop their own fierce partisan allegiances in alignment with the gender identities they advanced. Motivated to defend the traditional femininity and masculinity, evangelical women would play a critical role in the grassroots grassroots activism that launched the religious right. And I believe that Kristen puts forward these practices wholeheartedly as opposed to being a grifter, right? So like she fully is drinking the Kool-Aid when it comes to this kind of stuff. This is a bit of an aside, but when I was watching Funny Fridays and Jen Ish, or I guess it was it's two of them, but I'm talking about Jennifer specifically, had an episode where Jordan and McKay were featured and they were talking about how one of the siblings of the B of the Kristen and Bethany esque family. I'm confused on their last name because apparently like they had a last name from an adopted grandfather and they changed it. So, you know, the girl defined family. Um and came out the brother came out on Reddit about the experiences he of abuse that he had as a child. And I'll try to link the thread below. I actually think I did end up finding it. In the thread, the brother Michael describes that he had faced abuse from members of the religious community and his mother, the mother of Girl Defined, was essentially saying that this was just a load of nonsense. To the surprise of many, he actually speaks somewhat highly of his sisters and someone pleads that he understands that they were a victim of the mother's messaging and is are overall just a pawn in the fundamentalist game. We do need to remember, however, when we're talking about this, that you can be both a victim and a perpetrator. Kristen is a victim of this sort of brainwashing process that her mother did, but she can also turn around and do the same thing with even far more reach than her mother ever had through the Girl Defined platform. Kristen exists as a sort of wolf in sheep's clothing because this docile messaging and presentation makes the viewer see this sort of messaging as from a noble and good place, as opposed to perhaps having some other motive. While due to the brainwashing, it could somehow just be that, there also becomes this sort of idea of the bigotry, other such disgusting messages that they are platforming, and that is not an excuse. There are two main crutches that allow for this specifically, as in feeling okay about people like Kristen saying things like, Pride is not something that should be celebrated because it is the LGBTQIA plus people just shoving it in your face, being anti-trans, being anti-gay, etc. Right. The first main crutch of this is something that I've noticed and I've discussed in my own personal life with people that I know that are kind of more evangelical. And I always point out that for some reason they seem to be infantilized. And it's specifically when it is wi- when it, it revolves around women, they are heavily infantilized in these fundamentalist Christian circles. An example of this is how women are deemed like over emotional and like a hot flash could cause a war. A little bit of an aside again, but there's these TikToks that I've been seeing of someone who's like just screening just says anyone but Trump 2024. And he does street interviews uh, sometimes at like Trump rallies and stuff. He was asking the question, can a woman be president and many of the answers aligned with the paradigms that i've just set up now in this video i'll uh, pop that tiktok in now can a woman be president the presidency is a man's job i have women are qualified to be president no a female has more hormones she could start a war in 10 seconds if she has hot flashes whatever boom haven't all wars been started by men Mm. yes Whenever I hear president, I think of man. It's a man's job. What, what, what sort of, I may be... Uh, close-minded. No, yeah, well, no. Um, Misogynistic? <laughs> no. You're voting against your own interests. That's it. Thank you very much. These extreme nations, they don't, they don't treat women with respect. We treat women with respect here. Yes, we do. That's an American ideal. Yeah. Tell me about your shirt. What's it say? It says, <laughs> Hillary sucks. <laughs> but not like Monica. Hilarious. So we were talking about treating women with respect. It's an American ideal that we treat women with respect. You gotta give me the back of that shirt one more time. That's too much fun. Trump that bitch! <laughs> we don't even see the irony in it. I love it, right? As passion- the other aspect in which I talked about and defined in the, uh, the Rhetoric of Brittany Dawn video, which I'll link down below, is the concept of religious speak which is refers to the con- the concept that doctrines and messages can be separated when they are veiled or not veiled in a religious context. In other words, people can be hateful to, for example, the LGBTQIA plus community, which is something that is seen as objectively bad by most people. But then if you put it under a Christian spin, it's fine because they're just believing what's in the Bible. For example, like if someone is just spewing hate speech just for no reason, like they're saying like people who are gay are, I don't know, 
just innately evil or something. Obviously, something that just people are going to jump on and be like, that's ridiculous. It's not a good idea. That's gross, whatever. But then when Steven Crowder says he does not believe in gay marriage because this sort of LGBTQIA plus agenda is being put forward, it exists to infringe on the Christian nuclear family, then that's fine. Also, if you hear snoring, like Gus is ripping fa- uh, fat snooze on the ground. And while I'm bringing forth this source, Steven Crowder example, because he's so forceful and loud and yucky that like it becomes kind of obvious that that's something that he's doing. But Kristen's doing it as well, just in a sort of bubbly millennial pink packaging. But what we're going to do is we're going to move on to the other bubbly millennial sister, to kind of envelop this sort of idea that I'm going into and talk about Bethany. So part three, the rhetoric of Bethany Beale. Bethany is the less passive sister in the Girl Defined duo, starting as the perpetually perpetually single sister to newlywed to new mother. Bethany definitely seeks validation and a need to be above Kristen. It's sort of clear from the dynamic that exists in the videos. I can put in some clips now of the sort of kind of weird tension that they have when they talk to each other. And I was thinking about for a couple first dates that I went on. I mean, you got married young. You didn't have as many first date opportunities young compared to me. Um, I had a first date with Zach, true. But I, I think that my experience with first dates is so relatable to what many of you are experiencing or thinking because first dates, as exciting as they are, or just even one first date, it is absolutely terrifying. Like, okay, <laughs> I'm going with this person. I may know them really well. I may not know them really well. And what are we supposed to do for the time that we're together? And what are we supposed to talk about? And what if it's awkward? And how do I even really get to know him? And the stress can become real. And then you kind of freak yourself out. And then you're really awkward. And you're like, wow, well, we had no fun. And how I'm really stressed and sweaty. <laughs> I stink. <laughs> so especially in Texas where it's like, really hot. First one, Kristen is more of a girly girl than Bethany. Oh my goodness. That's so funny. <laughs> what would you say? Well, I wonder, I'm trying to think. Obviously people make these assumptions based on what they yeah. see on social media and what they see like, I guess what they hear, because growing up, I feel like you were more the tutu girl later on. <laughs> I was not the, I was the tomboy growing up. You were the tomboy as a kid, but then you got in that tutu phase where you were all about like the, um, the for like two years. <laughs> okay. But I would say yes, overall, I'm for sure more the girly girl as I think about our childhood. I was, sure all I had in my yeah, image yeah, yeah. was you wearing tool skirts. I was like, what? What does this mean to you? So he's like, yes, ma'am. And you look back and you're like, explain more. What does this mean to you? Unpack it for me. Why are you laughing at me? Because I was going to see how long you ran with the cowboy. Like, and I was going to try to jump in. It's because I'm watching a show right now and it's like they're kind of country. So uh, I, yes, yes, ma'am. Cowboy and cowgirl, you know. This need and drive is so strong that people have picked up on on the snark subreddits and stuff. And I've even felt the vibes. That's why I aligned the intro sequence to the way that I did. While Kristen was suffering from years of infertility issues, Bethany essentially became instantly pregnant upon ha- upon getting married. And she was sort of seemingly shading her sister who had infertility issues. I saw this when it was happening at the time, but I had trouble kind of going back and finding the references that I was talking about. And then I thought it was crazy. And then when I was watching Funny Friday's coverage, Jennifer or Jen or whatever also said that. So I'm not crazy, but I can't seem to find it. And another thing is Bethany was married much later than most evangelical girls or women. She was fully a woman at the time because she got married at 29, 30-ish. I talked about before how a lot of evangelicals do not believe that women should work. They should tend to the home, tend to children, etc. Now, in this economy, you can't necessarily live with your family that late into adulthood. And you especially cannot live without working if you are not under your parents still. And this really, I find, caused Bethany to take this sort of girl boss form that she has now continued into her marriage. Bethany, I've seen no instances of ever advocating for education past high school. I've never heard of, they they actually tend to be kind of against the sort of kind of liberal education system. And this is very intentional. And I don't think because of leftist ideology, but as opposed to these studies that have kind of come out that have shown that Working women who are further educated found that they did not value time tending at the home in comparison to lower levels of education or educated women in the home. So by that, I mean a woman who does a university degree will be way less satisfied with staying home and doing housework as opposed to a woman who just 
just did high school and that's it. This is a paper by an author named Eaglehart and they write, the data presented here suggests that this rescue reaction may be more appropriate for housewives who are ambivalent or negative toward housework and plan to work in the future. For housewives who wish to remain housewives, rescue attempts may be inappropriate and met with resistance. Rather than being aimed towards housewives in general, encouragement to relinquish the housewife role should be directed towards specific subgroups for the housewife population. Younger, college-educated housewives are the least likely to have positive housework attitudes and most likely to have future work plans. Several interpretations are plausible. First, these wives may be bored and humiliated by housework. Perhaps there's the wives who should be singled out for special attention because they need to be assisted in securing outside employment. Second, these wives may have simply delayed by choice their employment activities. Younger wives are in the childbearing and childrearing years may not want to be home with their children on a full-time basis. At some time in the future, when the children are older, they may see gainful employment. Finally, these younger, educated housewives may have a more positive view of the labor force participation. Their educational status may assure them of jobs that provide a certain degree of meaningfulness, satisfaction, and financial reward. The less educated housewives, however, may feel their job opportunities are limited to low pay, low status jobs. They are concluded by the rewards that are not sufficient to compensate for the negative features from their labor force participation. So in very normal people speak, there are a few elements that come into this. For one, if you just do high school, the jobs are worse. Like typically, you're kind of stuck in a lot of minimum wage jobs. Am I saying that's always the case? No, there's obviously there's you can go into trades, construction, other manual labor jobs. However, those are also predominantly male dominated. For women, it's typically if you're just doing high school, it's typically things like retail and man, and, and that type of jobs that are kind of available to you. As opposed to if you're university educated, there are possibilities of like working with the government, working in schools and education, working in uh, nursing and medicine, other such things like that, that are other female dominated parts of the economy and that they can be more secure in their job, more satisfied with the work. This is also along with the component of how you find yourself more when you're allowing yourself to leave your small town, for example, and move to university and kind of get that time with yourself to tackle with your own past, present, and future, and as well as your education. That's actually why I advocated for it the most. I find like almost what you learn in school comes second, and there's just so much that you learn about yourself that I find people like in my personal life that never left the small town are still obtuse to and just remain in this position of this like very stagnant position that is... I guess a bit disappointing. This comes from because I work in education, but there's a very calculated assessment that comes with Bethany's direction to forward this fundamentalist lifestyle in an economy that doesn't necessarily support one income households. Bethany forwards the old ideologies that the mother must tend to the home and stay in the home. However, she puts it in a new girl boss bow. She understands that the main concern is women working outside of the home not necessarily working period because housework is also work so she shapes her lifestyle as this girl boss with no selfish desires like career power and status nothing that stays above god being a mother being a loving wife and tending to the home bethany does forward the idea of that if you're not a mother it's not rewarding and it's not fulfilling and that being a mother is the purpose for a woman's existence they associate not being a mother as a sort of evil, corrupted force placed on earth to cast a shadow and to kind of fight against God's will for women. Wow, like how sad that we view children as such a burden yes. and such a, like we're losing ourselves and it's just the worst, you know? I mean, oh, that just breaks my heart. Yes, like the ball and chain joke start yeah. with marriage. Like, oh, ball and chain, like you're going to be chained for life. Like you're entering this prison when yeah. you get married. Like that's the narrative of culture regarding marriage. And then children, it's even worse. Oh, yeah. It's like double ball and chain. Like, oh, if you're ever going to have kids, like wait as long yeah. as possible. Like Breathe don't get eggs. there. <laughs> yes, which is why it's so important as Christian women that we aren't passive about pursuing an intentional biblical yeah. mindset because we can't help but hear the world's narrative, hear the world's message, like soak up the worldview of culture. We can't help it because we live in it day in and day out. So much of what we consume, so much of what we see, that is the worldview that we're soaking up. So if we aren't intentionally, like we like to use this analogy, like swimming against the current, like we're all flowing down the current of culture naturally. And unless we as Christians aren't intentional to say, I'm going to swim against this current by digging into God's word, reading biblically gospel-based resources, um, curriculum, like studying, growing from Christian leaders who are wiser and smarter and trying to understand what does God say about this? Where is his heart in this? Then we are naturally going to latch on to the mindset of culture. McLeod 
writes an example of what this means. Women who work outside of the home while their children are young are seen as the root cause of divorce, infidelity, juvenile delinquency, teen pregnancy, pornography, homosexuality, and male underemployment. Further, conservative Christian writers characterize working mothers as unhappy, libertines destined for loneliness and failure. Indeed, conservative Christians consider the childless feminist the most aberrant and unhappy person. One often mentioned example in the literature comes from the author Taylor Cladwell from Family Weekly. Now that I've provided the context as to what perception Bethany has on motherhood and childbearing, I hope that my previous comments on Kristen and how she was kind of forced to talk about the infertility are kind of more contextualized that I wasn't just trying to make someone feel bad. Bethany appears to be the entrepreneur of the two sisters, that one with the sort of drive, and is often leading the videos, talks, conferences, etc. And now she even leads a course on marital relations, (laughs) but only sexy time that honors God. Also, Girl Defined has made a course on making courses in the past as well, amongst a lot of other things. As mentioned, this sort of work at home message relates to that villainization of women being out of the home. And if you make a course on making courses or make a course on (laughs) sucking dick and cock, then, you know, you're still under God's whatever. I don't know if you can actually like do that under god i don't care that much regarding the marital relations course bethany forces sort of cognitive dissonance when it comes to the culture around purity culture and how it shapes women into hyper sheltered beings who are not even allowed to have a single sexual thought like i'm so serious they have blogs and stuff that push forward this concept called in uh called a mind virgin as in like you can't think about pee pee your bum bums or like you're having brain sex. Once a woman is married, then all of a sudden she needs to be a sexual being. And not only that, uh, they need to be constantly on the ready to serve their husbands whenever and wherever they decide. So you gotta be sucking and fucking around the clock. After spending years perpetuating kind of arbitrary purity standards, Bethany ran a sort of cash grab sex course to supposedly fill the gap that the church left while never actually mentioning that it was the church that leaves this gap. Now, I'm personally not going to go over the course in detail because one, you have to pay for it. And two, it's like way too many hours of content that I have time to go through. For those of you who are wondering if the quality or the sta- or their stagnant uploads or a couple of other things, it's just because I am doing a full time teaching internship. So I'm just kind of not in a position where I can put things as much work into this as I would normally like to. But to summarize, the course is essentially just a set of Zoom call uh, collections kind of filmed on shitty webcams. The parts relating to the professionals are essentially just shilling periods that allows them to talk about their own books or courses or conferences that they do and sell themselves. But to kind of summarize Bethany's overall rhetoric, because of the religious messaging and that sort of pre-existing hold that it has on people through generations, they can also they can shift their hateful messaging, their anti-feminist agendas, anti-LGBTQIA plus agendas, etc., to this kind of cute little package for the Girl Defined Ministries channel. This kind of allows for this sort of money grab, hateful, bigoted messaging and channel and positioning and courses and how they kind of live their whole life to be excused as kind of just two girly pops living under jesus i'm just a god fearing christian and i love jesus christ (laughs) the problem is when i try to do that accent i kind of blend into forrest gump a little bit in more not intentionally by any means i just literally can't do the accent (laughs) anyways i'm a good god loving christian and i gotta go beat the meat on my husband because he asked me to but even though I don't really feel like doing it but the transformed wife told me that I gotta do that whenever he says you know that's kind of an example (laughs) I've gone off the rails I gotta stop recording (laughs) to conclude fundamentalism still holds a majority of its original rhetorical roots but they can sometimes shape it under two pretty skinny blonde girls that love Jesus Christ and they just put it in the modern pretty packages so Links to socials, ways to support the channel, including Amazon, Patreon, and YouTube memberships down below, along with, if I didn't say sources already, my social media, affiliate links, other such things, and an email to suggest content. And uh, yeah, praise be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything else that y'all are into? Um, blessed be thy squish gang, who were present today, but we're also a ministry here today. We're in church. 
It is actually, if I, I gotta wait, I gotta clear my messages so I don't dox anybody. It is Sunday. Isn't that fitting? All right. I'll see y'all when I see y'all because everything's a disaster right now. But anyways, have a good one. Bye. Look like Obelix Asterix. No, no, no. You, you deserve to have your internet access revoked. It needs to be revoked, man. And he just titles it real. He just says real. Yeah, you're out of here. Yeah, you're out of here, buddy. Check out my W. Case art. <laughs> it looks great. <laughs> yeah, it looks, looks great. Hang it up, kid. You'll never be an artist. Hang it up. Just give it up, kid. You'll, you'll never make it.